Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in the last week particularly David P. Yeager, beloved son, brother of my friend and classmate Mike, uncle and nephew, Francis J. Vanston, devoted husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, World War II Army veteran, and 36-year member of the Scranton Fire Department, Harriet Veronica Hainos, loving wife, mother of our friend Anne Marie and husband Chuck, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, and aunt, and their dear families and many friends who suffer their loss. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscombe? Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third Order 3A, audit status from Robert Rossi and Company, received May 6, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, Minutes of the regular meeting of the members of the Scranton Housing Authority held April 1, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, applications along with decisions rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board on Wednesday, May 8, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Uh, prior to announcements, I'd like to make a motion to table items 7C, D, and E. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. On the question? On the question, uh, these are the uh, three pieces of legislation dealing with the food vendors uh, and restaurants. Um, after a series of meetings held um, this week and last, we were presented with a, a number of recommendation, agreed upon recommendations from those meetings, and we are tabling these so that we can take a week to review the recommendations from the, the group that met and to implement them into the legislation. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Is there anyone else with announcements? Please remember to turn off all cell phones and refrain from speaking during the council meeting. The annual Armed Forces Day Parade will be held this Saturday, May 18th, 2013, in downtown Scranton, beginning at 11 a.m. Several musical groups, the Pennsylvania National Guard's Scranton-based 55th Brigade, and dozens of other military and veterans units will participate. Bring your families and friends out to honor our brave, selfless servicemen and women and their families who have sacrificed for our freedoms. A new addition to the parade day is the Gino J. Murley Veterans Center and Matthew's Mission 5K Run and Walk. The run will start at 9 a.m. on Franklin Avenue and benefits the Veterans Center. Registration is $20 on the day of the race. Finally, 
This Tuesday, May 21st, is primary election day, and you are not, are not required to show ID to vote. Make every effort to exercise your voting privileges in this important city and county election. Best of luck to all the candidates and to the people of Scranton. Uh, could I it. add something to that, Mrs. Evans? Certainly. Um, just a note for the primary election. Because of the ballot questions that are on there, this is not a closed primary. If you are not a registered Republican or Democrat, normally you could not vote in the um, primary election. But for this election, because of the ballot questions, anybody who is a registered voter may vote on those ballot questions. So please, um, please go out and cast your ballot, even if you are not registered for Democrat or Republican Party. And both sides of the ballot also. Yes, it's a rather lengthy and two-sided ballot, so please. Thank you. Mrs. Craig? Fourth Order Citizens Participation. Our first speaker tonight is Bernie McGurl. Good evening, Council. I'm here this evening to invite you and the community to join us along the Lackawanna River for a River Fest on Saturday, June the 1st. I have some invitation for you. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just uh, want to spend a moment to talk about Riverfest. It's our annual celebration of the Lackawanna River. And uh, we're going to be holding it uh, down at the uh, Scranton Riverfront uh, along Olive Street uh, by the uh, Heritage Trail by the Icebox Complex it's near Memorial Stadium. It's a day long event. It starts in the morning uh, with a canoe and kayak run. Uh, from two launch points, one in Archibald and one in Blakely. And it originally started out as the Lackawanna River Canoeathon in 1973. So this is actually the 40th running of the Lackawanna River Canoeathon. And uh, the, the race concludes uh, by the Allo Street finish line uh, sometime between uh, uh, 12 and 1 o'clock as the stragglers come in. Uh, later in the afternoon, uh, all afternoon actually at the finish line, we have the uh, showmobile, the city showmobile is set up and we have a variety of musical entertainment uh, for young and old. And uh, at uh, uh, three o'clock, we're inviting everyone to get creative, come on down, get a boat, get something that floats. We're gonna be launching the regatta from Sweeney's Beach, a little uh, landing beach uh, up in the Pinebrook neighborhood and you'll float down with your costumes and uh, silly hats and whatever. And uh, we have a whole variety of, uh, of uh, prizes for uh, the regatta. The regatta is absolutely free. The only thing you need is a sense of humor and imagination. So we want to encourage everyone. You can come out and uh, visit the LRCA website at www.lrca.org and click on Riverfest and you'll get information on the regatta or give us a call at the LRCA office at 347-6311 and we'll fill you in on any questions and details that you'd like to get. A Little bit later in the afternoon to wrap up the day's festivities, we have the famous Lackawanna River Duckathon. It's a real duck race, not with little rubber ducks actually. We have 10 specially trained Lackawanna River racing ducks. They're uh, painted up uh, rather colorfully by some students in local schools and actually they're decoy ducks if you want to get down to it but uh, they are trained to race and they do move down river with the current and if you uh, happen to get a ticket uh, with the uh, winning duck that could win you five hundred dollars so we'd like to in invite everyone to come out and spend the day on the Lackawanna River with the LRCA and celebrate the river on Saturday June the first thank you all Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Labray, uh, and I, I'm unable to read the last name. Okay. Thank you. Bill Jackowitz.
Good evening, Scranton City Council, Bill Jackowitz. Good evening. Uh, I've been Good spending evening. a lot of time lately walking, and I'm not even running for office, but I've, I've been going around talking to people within the city of Scranton, and, and quite honestly, we have a lot of upset people in, within the city of Scranton. Uh, uh, basically, you know, because they're not happy with what's been happening with the city. Uh, actually, this city needs needs to start behaving behaving as if it already is bankrupt because people realize that we just don't have the money. The money is not there, and there's really no way way of generating the money to pay what's going to be coming our way in the next few years. We need to start working on that now. Not when the new mayor and the new council takes over. We need to start working on these areas right now. Now, like, the comments have been made that things don't happen overnight. I, I would just like to remind people that for 7,797 days and 255 months, this is how long the taxpayers of Scranton have been waiting for the elected officials of Scranton to do something positive about the financial situation in the city of Scranton. That's a long time. Nothing has been done to solve the problem. As time goes on, the situation worsens. Unemployment rate, highest in the state, 36 consecutive months. The 500 block of Lackawanna Avenue, still vacant. Potholes, Scranton streets, bridges, and sidewalks, unsafe. I personally have lived in three third world countries that look better than Scranton, Central City and neighborhoods. Vacant storefronts, vacant space, Steamtown Mall, housing projects, dirty, garage, dirty garbage everywhere in the housing projects, overgrown properties in every, every neighborhood. Soon we're going to look like Detroit, Michigan if we continue on the road we're on now. I do, not, I do not want to hear any more about cooperation. A budget that is not balanced, a recovery plan that would not work is not cooperation. It is wasted time at taxpayers' expense. Sl slideshows and false numbers and hope will not resolve the financial mess I call Scranton insane government. When four witnesses testify for the city and give contradicting testimony, something is wrong. Scranton's recovery plan was all about borrowing $14 million, creating a deeper hole for the taxpayers to crawl out of. Scranton's credit rating below junk bond rating. Loans being defaulted on, why? Interest rates high, why? Because the credit rating in Scranton is nothing but junk. Again, let's get real, stop playing politics. The only elected official who is up front is Pat Rogan, and the voters of Scranton realize that. Gatelli and McGough's council set the city back 50 years, virtually bankrupting the city. Evans council continued with the borrowing, raised taxes, enabling the administration to continue down the path of financial destruction. Result, higher taxes and larger debt for the taxpayers. Why would anybody trust the mayor and business administrator, or for that matter, any member of the Doherty administration? They have been proven to be wrong on just about every issue that is why Scranton remains bankrupt for 21 years and counting. No one expected change overnight. On the other hand, it's been 7,798 nights that we've been waiting for change. That should be long enough to wait for real cooperation from our elected Scranton officials. I'm disgusted with Scranton politics. Actually, I'm disgusted with politics in general because look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. and Harrisburg and everywhere else and politicians who have caused this financial mess in Scranton. This mess was caused by our politicians, our elected mayor and our elected city councils, and uh, the, the controller. It wasn't caused by the citizens. We're the ones who have to pay the bills, but it was caused by our elected officials. I don't understand why our elected officials can't understand that. They were the ones who passed the budgets. They were the ones who passed the recovery plan. They were the ones who wrote the budgets. They were the ones who went out and got the borrowing. They were the ones who took the fire and, and police to court. The politicians did it, not the citizens. But yet the citizens continue to get railed on. Again, we need to do something about this now. We don't need to wait until January of 2014. 
We have a council seated right now, an elected council. We have an elected mayor seated right now. And you people need to start working on it now and not wait until January of 2014. It will be too late. Thank you. Our next speaker is Les Spindler. Good evening, Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, well, I don't know what the recommendations are with the food trucks that had your table with everything tonight, but uh, I just want to add that I hope one of those recommendations is keeping the distance from restaurants at 100 feet. If it's not, I think you should amend the ordinances to say that, because 250 feet is just too much, and uh, it's going to put these people out of business, and that's just going to hurt the city. Uh, moving on, uh, quite a few weeks ago I was here asking about a stop sign near the Isaac Trip School. I was wondering if any action has been taken on that yet. I know there's still no stop sign there. Has anybody gotten back to council on that? I don't believe so, Mr. Spindler. Oh, well, it figures. I just hope, you know, the next mayor, whoever it is, appoints people to know what they're doing and, and will cooperate with council other than what these department heads are doing now. I guess the only one that does cooperate is acting Chief Graziano. But uh, I hope in the future they uh, will cooperate with City Council. Uh, lastly, I read the Doherty newsletter yesterday about the uh, debate the other night, the mayoral debate, which I was unable to watch. And you know what? I'm tired of some of these candidates slinging mud. Why don't they just run on their qualifications and stop slinging mud. Oh, I know why they're slinging mud, because they don't have any qualifications. Because the tax collector who they're talking against is the only one that's qualified, and he comes out on his commercial saying what his qualifications are. Uh, Liz Randall can't even make a commercial on her own. She has an 81-year-old woman talking, saying, oh, she's educated and I like her. Oh, those are great qualifications to be mayor. Then we have another person coming out and say, I've been coming to council for 25 years. Again, are those qualifications to be mayor? I don't think so. This is the most important election, in, I think, in this city's history. And if we don't elect the right person, we're going to be in bankruptcy. And you can write that down, today's date, May 16th, 2013, that we will be in bankruptcy if uh, we don't elect the right person. There's only one person for that job. And I think you all know who I mean. And uh, at that debate, I hear that uh, Liz Randall brought up Attorney Walsh's name, which is a darn Mrs. shame. Mrs. Evans, that, this is inappropriate for the podium. Um, I agree that I am not in favor of campaign speeches at the podium. However, every individual has First Amendment rights to speak, and unless that individual is threatening the safety of others or is using um, obscene language, they have the right to speak. Thank you, Mrs. Evans. Uh, Mark Walsh, as everyone has heard from me in the past, was a longtime friend of mine. And to bring his name up when he can't defend himself was terrible. That's the You're incorrect. Uh, no, if, I, this I, is my if, time. If you're going to say she it, I'm going to She didn't name him by name, but she brought up the solicitor for the tax office. No, she did not name him. I, Mrs. Mr. Evans, Court can you did. ask him to stop? That's the, 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 the most unclassy move I have ever heard of. Mark Walsh had more class on his little finger than Liz Randall has in her own body. And uh, to come out with that, she, she, has, she has no qualifications. When it was brought up about her gun, she went, uh, uh, and she couldn't even answer a question. It was asked if she was out drinking that night, and she refused to answer the questions, which I think in itself answered the question. And she is not a person that's qualified to be our mayor. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ron Elman. Hello, Council. Hello. Hello. 
a few short weeks ago this pathetic excuse for a newspaper printed a lengthy article crucifying young Miller over a past traffic offense. A, a traffic offense for crying out loud. And it hadn't happened recently, it was in the past. I feel that this feeble attempt by them was ju just a, an offense to just t take away any future political uh, interest that young Miller has. And I think the city needs Mr. Miller more than he needs the city of Scranton. We need all these young people. In the, in the same hand, as hard as they were working to bring forth this article, at the other end of the spectrum, they are working as hard as they can to keep quiet, to sweep under the rug the error and judgment that Ms. Randall made. Th this isn't right. This is a deliberate action by this paper. You know, people say they'll put things aside, but they don't forget. Both these things are an error in judgment to me. You know, if, if, if I had known a few short weeks ago that you can run for mayor and be devoid of any experience, any character, trust, values, integrity, and so on, I would have run, believe me. And I probably would have been endorsed by the Democratic Party around here. <laughs> if, if this if this gun scenario had happened to me or Mr. Miller or to most of the people in this city, there'd be no end to it. It'd been investigated. It would have carried on and on and on in the newspaper for, for weeks and weeks. But uh, I guess we're all responsible for our own actions, except Ms. Randall. Again, I cannot in good conscience comprehend why why any of these people are even running for the office it's such a thankless job it, it's, it's it's an impossible job to to be successful at in my opinion you know all councils additional revenue plans have failed for one reason or another and I'm not putting the blame on council. I just said that they have failed. Everything you've, everything people have come up with has just been uh, put aside. This new tax is going up 78 percent. is It's not going to achieve a good end. It's just going to cost us more and more empty houses and foreclosures. You can ask the banks. It's just. This is just not going to work. Something else has to be done. You know, I read a couple of weeks ago, King Henry VIII taxed the people of England so bad he owned a third of the country. It's the same thing with our city. We've lost a third of the, the city to these tax-exempt businesses. It's, it's, it's impossible to carry on. It, 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 he failed, and, and, and we can't carry on with a third of our taxable properties gone. You know, we've had uh, 10 years of total mismanagement, and 10 years of a mayor completely devoid of any financial ability. That's, that's 3,650 Jackowitz days, 10 years. I, I, the last thing we need is someone that's going to support his policies and his programs and want them to continue. There's just going to be brutal consequences for all of us if we choose the wrong person. But I've heard a dozen people 
say they're not going to vote. They don't like this guy or that guy. That's not going to solve anything. You, you, you people you, out there Allen. have got to vote for some good government. Thank you. Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Uh, Gerard Hetman from Lackawanna County's Community Relations Department. Uh, good to see you as always. To begin this evening, we would like to announce that the Lackawanna County Department of Community Relations is currently working to organize the first annual Lackawanna County Job Fair. Uh, the Job Fair will take place Thursday, June 13th from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. at PNC Field in Music. The event will be held on the Suite Level Concourse. So you walk up to the stadium and take the first glass door on the right uh, near the ticket office and the exhibitors will be on the Suite Level Concourse area. The job fair is free and open to the community. Candidates of all ages, backgrounds, and experience levels are encouraged to attend. There will be companies offering full-time, part-time, seasonal, and internship positions. So this is an event that's acceptable for all working ages, uh, skill abilities and sectors, something for people who are looking for family sustaining full-time employment, uh, possibly additional part-time employment, and again, seasonal and internship jobs. So possibly college students, high school students uh, are welcome to attend. And we're working to get every major private sector employer in and around Lackawanna County to be an exhibitor at the job fair. Uh, if you know of anybody, uh, council members who maybe hire an employee, an employer, excuse me, that's looking to hire, uh, odds are we may have spoken to them already, but if not, feel free to contact me or stop me after the meeting. Um, we'd be happy to get in touch with them. Uh, this is something that the commissioners are committing to, committed to do to working at that unemployment rate that some of the speakers have referenced uh, kind of hangs over our heads in this area and all of us I know in many capacities are trying to chip away at that we see this as an initiative that hopefully will help to combat the persistently high unemployment rate uh, so please tell your friends neighbors anyone who's searching for any type of employment uh, this will hopefully be a good opportunity for them to match up with that and again it's Thursday June 13th 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. at PNC field and again completely free uh, no parking charge and also for exhibitors, uh, there's no vendor fee. Uh, so anyone who comes to offer employment looking for employees, we're not charging them uh, for that. So it's particularly attractive for everyone who's looking to get involved. Uh, secondly, actually, Mrs. Evans, thank you for mentioning the parade uh, and also the 5K run walk. Uh, our, off our office has worked with Matthew's Mission, uh, which is the group organizing the Gino Murley 5K. And they're very excited about that. They have a pretty good turnout, I think, already, and they'll probably get some race day registrations. But we invite everyone to come down to the parade. Uh, the parade sips off at 11 a.m., and uh, I think I saw most of the council members there last year. So uh, we hope everyone will come out and salute our veterans, our current military personnel. And then lastly, uh, just one other event that we like to mark, especially here in the city, is the upcoming Arts on Fire Festival uh, and Fire at the Furnace fundraiser. That's June 7th, 8th, and 9th uh, downtown at the historic Iron Furnaces. And that event kicks off Friday night during First Friday with the Arts on Fire fundraiser, uh, which is a $15 admission charge uh, or $20 right at the event. At the Iron Furnaces, uh, raises funds for the Anthracite Museum up in McDade Park which administers the iron furnaces. Uh, that's an event where you pay at the door, uh, there'll be a live iron pour, and food and drink are free with that event with your admission. Uh, there'll also be basket raffles and things of that nature. And then Saturday and Sunday of that weekend, June 8th and 9th, is the actual Arts on Fire Festival. No charge to attend that. Uh, starts at 11 a.m. both days, wraps up 7 p.m. on Saturday, and then 4 p.m. on Sunday. Um, all three nights there'll be musical entertainment on performers, and then on Saturday and Sunday, there was food vendors uh, and also exhibitors, uh, such as sculptors, artists, who will be looking to sell uh, in a marketplace type setting. This is, I think, the fourth year that the festival has taken place, and it's growing every year. Again, brings in a lot of folks, brings out a lot of people in the city and in the surrounding communities, and also brings in visitors, uh, both to attend the festival and to vend and do business here, really from all over the country. Uh, so we're looking forward to hopefully a good turnout. Invite everybody to come out for that. So that's all we have for this evening, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Greg mm -hmm. Evans. Good evening, Council. Greg Evans, Scranton resident, homeowner, small business owner. Um, I have two things I want to discuss or just talk about. Um, the first thing is and again, this is probably not a council issue, it's probably an administration issue, and it's unfortunate that no one is here to answer this. But um, 
regarding the recent paving project in Jackson Street, um, can any of you, do any of you know um, who, where that money came from? Is that DCED money or OECD money? It's, it was OECD money. I actually have some notes. I'll be speaking about this issue um, under motions. I, I assume you're referring to the, the blocks that were paved and now they're going to be torn up um, by yes. the water company. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't happy either when I learned that you know a, a road that was just paved using using federal dollars um, in two blocks, three blocks from my house in West Side um, was paved, and that now that's going to be cut up. And you know, obviously the utility will repair it when when they're done. Right. But the issue is we could have used that money to pave another road. Absolutely, that's my same concern and yeah. concern of many other people. Okay, thank you. And um, I want to talk about the. Um, the food trucks. I know it's tabled, and thank you for doing that. Um, I want to speak about the economic impact just one more time. Um, I want to bring us back to months ago when um, we ha we were fighting about the not fighting, just um, the parking meter agreement came up, and with the increases of the days, times, and costs, and I brought here nearly 1,000 signatures in protest of that agreement. Um, and that was from businesses, not just the businesses, but also employees and visitors. And it's a bigger picture than just, um, than just one special interest or another special interest. It's, um, it wasn't that the, the businesses simply disliked the changes. It came from more than just the businesses. But it was um, the negative economic impact of those proposed changes. So thank you for t tabling items 7, C, D, and E and giving serious consideration to what um, to Scranton Tomorrow is going to, has offered you with the negotiations. And I just want to implore that when you're making the decisions, ask yourselves two questions. One, what is the economic impact of the new legislation? And two, will it affect Scranton positively in the long term, not just the short term? Thank you. Thank you, and our next speaker is Dania, Dania L. Gazelle. Daisy Ayala. Marianne Petrasco. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm, I have a food truck called the Picnic Stand, and I'm brand new. I've only been doing it a couple of months. Uh, for, I didn't realize I, I signed the paper. I didn't realize I was going to be speaking, but that's okay. Um, what I would like to say is I am new. Um, the health department, Mary Foley and Mark, have been excellent. The people with the meters have been great because I had them check my truck out and advise me every inch of the way. They've been wonderful. So if you want to make a note of that, they are great. Um, as far as I go with, um, I went to two of the meetings and I totally agree with the restaurants. A food truck does not belong in front of a restaurant, ever. Um, I considered opening up a restaurant. I didn't for financial reasons. So my husband and I discussed it and we opened up a food truck. And I love doing it, I really do. So I, I agree, no food truck should be allowed in front of a business that's serving food, but I don't agree with the limitation. I believe it should be 100 feet because that's reasonable, it's fair. Um, when I was speaking at one of the meetings, I did tell them, you know, we do live in America. It is a land of opportunity. I don't believe in restriction of fair trade. Um, and I think 100 feet, and we did agree on 100 feet at the last meeting, which was great. I was happy. Um, let's see. The 100 feet was a big deal for me. I agreed that the fees should be 250 because the restaurants are paying that. Should it be 500? I don't think we should be penalized. It's not fair. Um, but the 250 was agreed upon, which was also a good positive. I do think food trucks are a positive influence. It caters to a totally different clientele. Um, if I'm with my friends going out for lunch, you know, definitely I want to be in a restaurant, I want to sit down, 
and I want to have a leisurely lunch and talk. But at lunchtime in Scranton, you have a lot of people who are limited with a half hour. Uh, what I do is I give my phone number to them and they could call me and I'll have the food ready for them and it's, you know, they get their food and they're back in their office. There is a lot of positive things to be said for that. It is a different clientele. So as far as the restaurants not wanting us, totally different, different setup. Um, uh, they were talking about fines and you know if a truck is going to do something that's not right with the health department they should be you know have a fine it's only right that's why I've had Mary Foley and them coming in my truck make sure it's you know all right um, I'm trying to think what else they were talking about I'm a little nervous but um, basically it's just nobody should park in front of a restaurant I wouldn't want to hurt anyone in fact, as far as I'm concerned, today and yesterday was the first day I was at Courthouse Square, and I was far, far away from everyone. And I made sure of that. I've been staying down at the State Building. Unfortunately, there's no foot traffic. So one day I sold like five sandwiches. Yesterday and today, it's, it's good for business. You know, I, I did much better. But I am staying far away from everyone. But if you increase it more than 100 feet, there's really no place to go because you're going to find Subway or a Mini Mart or, you know, somebody's going to be selling food. And I think it's too limiting. But 100 feet is totally reasonable because then you're not near that restaurant. And 100 feet's a good distance, you know, because I'm making sure that I'm beyond that. So I hope and pray that you will keep it at the 100 feet. And if you want to raise our permit price to 250, as far as like I'm, I'm speaking for me, that's fine too. Um, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Um, I don't know how this works. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I have no questions. Is there anyone on council? Like I said, I'm, I'm brand new at this. I just want to do everything right to the law, make sure I'm doing everything right. And I appreciate you listening to me. Absolutely. Okay. And just so you, you know, understand, this legislation was not initiated by city council. It was sent down to us by the mayor and his administration. So these were their proposals. And because council members had um, many concerns about the legislation that was submitted to us, and because so many uh, members of the public and owners of food trucks came before council to discuss that potential legislation. I asked for these meetings between the oh, brick and mortar wonderful. establishments and the food vendors because none of us own restaurants or food trucks. We're not, mm -hmm. certainly not experts in that area. And we, we wanted exactly what has happened, that both sides would discuss all of the issues and come to a consensus that was satisfactory to everyone so that all businesses are welcome in the city and basically operate on a level playing field. Absolutely. So we very much appreciate having these recommendations. Unfortunately, we only received them about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Oh. So we weren't able uh, to draft an amendment to the legislation that will make the corrections to it. However, we are hoping that we can get the work done for next Thursday's meeting and oh, okay. uh, put the three pieces of legislation back on the table for a final vote. All right, and the mediator, she was wonderful and she listened to both sides. It was really nice and Greg was copying everything down and it went really well, so that was a, a good idea. But anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And remember, you. 100 feet. The next speaker is Reginald Clark. Good evening, Council. Good evening. How you doing? Um, I'd like to first say, um, I would like to thank all of y'all in advance for y'all time and consideration in regards to the food truck issues. I'm a food truck owner. Um, 
putting the meetings together with both sides, you know, was a good idea. You know, good communication came out of that, you know, in both ways. Also, a lot of good information and knowledge that people didn't know, including, uh, you know, elected officials and the ones that supposed to enforce this ordinance. Um, wording is always, you know, one word can tra change a whole sentence, a whole paragraph, and I think that's what's really going on within the existing ordinance. Um, not to dwell a whole lot about the ordinance because it's, it's kind of contradictory, you know, from something that was from 1910, you know, it ain't too many people out there sharpening knives on the pavement no more, you know, and, uh, you know, like someone said before, you know, free trade and, and different things come about, you know, and, it, and it's good economic development for the city as a whole, you know, it, it does bring in revenue. Uh, one of the things that was part of the proposal that we talked about on both sides was in regards to the mercantile tax. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been a mercantile taxpayer for five years, you know, but that doesn't, you know, uh, make me the same as brick and mortar because I'm entitled a peddler or a vendor. So those was very, you know, good issues that we talked about, you know, in regards to paying the tax that's, that's due. So, um, I put that in council hand that everything can come out good with this and the ordinance can be changed in one way or the other that can benefit both sides. Um, and I'll leave that at that. But there is another issue that I would like to address council about and if I'm out of order, please stop me. Um, I just, I'm at, a brick I'm at a brick wall and I don't know which way to go because I heard you say how something was passed down from the mayor's administration. Uh, there was something that I brought to the administration last year in regards to the old Gerard School on West Parker Street in North Scranton. Uh, I brought to the administration in regards to, uh, it was a blighted area. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Gerard School burnt down 50 years ago. That lot there was very blighted. Uh, we took volunteers and we cleaned it up. And then I went to the, I went to the mayor's office and asked the mayor, uh, could the city donate that land to make a uh, community park out of it? Uh, at first, it was in regards to uh, my grandson that died up on New Dark Region Road, but uh, the mayor agreed to do it. But then uh, he said that I had to talk to Paul Walk, Mr. Walker, the city uh, attorney. But I haven't been able to meet with him in a year now. I don't know if Mr. Hughes works with him or if he's a city attorney. But I'm asking because I don't know if y'all can guide me in regards to this project because it is a blighted area and do you mean uh, paul kelly paul kelly yes the city solicitor yes yes um well you can give all of your information to our assistant city clerk ms carrera okay your name phone number we can uh send a message to attorney kelly yes that you are very anxious to meet with him and you know you you can give um, I just saying because I know it was taxpayers money that that cleaned the property up mm -hmm. the city's the city uh, of Scranton maintenance department came out with dozers and knocked down the trees and everything and I understand that money needs to be used in the fiscal year that money was used for that purpose but now it's beginning to be blighted again mm -hmm. I have volunteers and stuff that want to clean it up but I mean also it's a city property so I don't want to in engage on something that I'm I don't want to break a law right well we can certainly um, you know give a summary of uh, the situation that you've enumerated for us and send that to the city solicitor asking him to contact you and schedule a meeting with you that would be wonderful certainly. thank you so much you're welcome and that's all I have I'll give my our next speaker is Joe Marie Yeaman. Hello, Council, and thank you for giving me a chance to speak. My name is Joe Marie Yeaman. I'm the owner of Eats Food Truck. I have a couple of concerns that I would like to bring um, up on the ordinance. First, thank you for tabling it and you know, not just rationally, you know, rationally making a decision for having a chance to look at it and come up with a conclusion. Um, my food truck is a different, is a little different than the day business because I work in the nights. I cater to the bar crowd. 
I started my business six years ago and have built it into something I'm very proud of. When I started there, I was, there were no other ven vendors on Linden Street. I offered a service that was, <clears throat> sorry. That's okay. Take I offered time. a service that was not offered during um, that time span. And as I said, I've been there for six years and I've never encountered any problems. I know and love my customers. I know their orders before they stepped up. I hugged crying girls, called taxis, and tucked drunk kids and, and sent them safely home. I add to the excitement of the evening and enha enhance the businesses of the bars across the street. Countless people tell me they come to the bars to come to the truck after they get out. It's a part of their evening. They bring family, friends, and I've even been introduced to parents who thank me for looking out for their kids. People who come, come from out of the area have commented it and are impressed with the friendly, vibrant, urban atmosphere in Scranton that my business supplies. I would like to bring up um, these needs to your attention in hopes, in, in hopes you take them into consideration when you vote on the ordinance. In addition to the 100 feet ruling, um, we need to have um, operating, hour, operating, operating hours need to be extended to 24 hours a day. And for the evening, if um, a business is closed, there should be no footage limitation, like, you know, like somehow from a time span, from a certain time span, that when there aren't any businesses open, that the food vendor should have the rights to be able to, to sell their wares, like, you know. Um, again, I love this city. I love working in the downtown Scranton. I've had two brick and mortar businesses in the city before, and I work hard to build my business. I buy supplies locally. My truck is even a national bakery truck. It was built by Joe's Audi Body Scranton and North Scranton Scranton Restaurant Supplies. So, like people who are, you know, saying that this business, these businesses aren't fruitful for the city, they are fruitful because not only are people coming in and enjoying themselves and adding to the to the beauty of the city, you know, we are also are extending our paychecks to other businesses, and it just. I, I just really believe that food trucks add a positive component to the city, and I'm just asking you guys to help me um, safeguard my livelihood and to keep the food trucks so that we can have a chance to. May I ask you one quick question? Yes. Um, you say that you operate only during the evening hours. Mm -hmm. um, is that only in the downtown area, or are you traveling throughout Just the city? Just downtown. Just the downtown? downtown yes. And, and actually, I didn't know. When I first got my license, I don't even remember who, who was the person who was in office at that point. But they told us you just had to stay 100 feet from, from a business. I was surprised when I found about the 24-hour ruling. At, after the last meeting, I was like, <laughs> Oh my God! And then they said that it was in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was a surprise. Actually, like it wasn't brought to our attention, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know, that's been my business for six years. Has been on that street in that spot. Like I've I've not moved. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thank you, much. guys. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If I could comment on that, please, ma'am. Yes, please. Um, the ordinance as it was adopted in Scranton really only applied to vendors that would come out during parade time, when there were the parades. Mm -hmm. That was the ordinance that was on the book. When you got your license, there was nothing that covered food carts or food wagons, or food trucks. Mm -hmm. So that what the original ordinance, as it would apply to people that came downtown during the parade time, they had to be 100 feet from an existing business, and that's why it says any mercantile business, anybody that pays a mercantile tax. That's when the hours were established because there weren't any parades at night. Right. Now maybe during the Italian festival that, that they wouldn't be out because the courthouse square, that would be at night. Uh, but these remote, that's what the ordinance was originally intended for. Um, when the ordinance came down from the solicitor's office, 
I reviewed it. It didn't have the specific sections of the ordinance. I looked up the ordinance and said that the amendments that were to be made should be made to those specific sections. Mm -hmm. And I raised the issue where they said for the food trucks to be within no more than 500 feet of any mercantile, any business that pays a mercantile tax in the city. What that would have done, there, there wouldn't have been any food trucks in downtown Scranton mm -hmm. because it just wasn't restaurants. Mm -hmm. It stated that any, any business that pays a mercantile tax. That was one of my comments that it should be limited just to any, any restaurant. The 500 feet was excessive because that would have, in effect, outlaw or prohibit, not outlaw, mm -hmm. but it would outlaw, you know, any food trucks within downtown Scranton. Mm -hmm. And I gave this memo to council to review when I sent it up yes. to Mr. Kelly. Um, so that, that they just put in the same hours, you know, one half hour before mm -hmm. sunset and eight in sunset in the morning, because that was, that would be applicable mostly to parades. So we could still leave, I say we, I could recommend to council, that that could still be there for those type of vendors. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the food trucks, food carts, there, that should be a separate area. It has nothing to do with those type of vendors that only come during, during mm -hmm. the time when there's parades. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to comment on that because, as you said, you got your permit six years ago. There really was no ordinance covering that, you know, covering food trucks. Mm -hmm. This is just a recent development. And I think council should be aware of that also. I don't think that I had that in my memo, but that's where the one hour, I think a half hour, mm -hmm. you know, before sunset and, you know, it's right. sunset in the morning until a half an hour before sun sunset. That's where that came in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, our next speaker is Malmar. No. Okay. Thank you, David Dobson. Good evening, Council. Dave Dobson. Good evening. Good evening. And I had a question on 7C and C, D, and E. Uh, would that be potentially come under an ex post facto where somebody decides whether it's logical to form a business and they put time and effort and money into it and then somehow something comes along and changes that? and makes it unprofitable. I also expressed with evening festivals and so forth, I had concerns about that. Uh, I have purchased food off of trucks and uh, I could have walked two or three blocks to a restaurant, but the truck was right there. And what they did have was pretty decent and attractive. And I have a little complaint about the current campaign signs were taken off my curb three signs two people sitting on that panel right there your signs are missing uh, at least one of them and it disgusts me and if i ever catch somebody well they might want to know karate <laughs> if it'll do them any good with me <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, it's really disgusting and it it throws suspicion on people that are probably innocent so also so uh, and I'd like to know uh, on 6a if that Duffy monument and uh, is affected uh, Sergeant Duffy at Duffy Park. If that involves Duffy Park, we should get compensation to move that monument because $20,000 doesn't sound like much if we have to move that monument out of there and find another home for it or something. Uh, so that's, that's the guy, uh, the World War I doughboy throwing the hand grenade. My dog always used to growl at that. <laughs> 
he thought somebody was throwing a rock at him or something. That was hilarious. Um, and I'd also like to note uh, my fourth comment is uh, the parking authority. Now, a lot of this has uh, blame for uh, our bond rating has gone with you people. And, you know, now here we were borrowing without authority. We had a, an attorney here advising uh, the parking authority principal not to uh, answer your questions like it was some kind of court of law. And I, I think it's time that some people lighten up on you people. It's, it's uh, yeah, we have a lot of crisis, but I know where they came from and I have a good memory. And uh, I'm patient, but maybe that's. And also number five on potholes. Uh, now, just a few months ago, this block was not paved out here on Mulberry Street. I don't know what number it is. But they were holding up for uh, uh, utility work. Well, it <coughs> seemed like it was in a month. And a little past the fire station, there's a big divot in the street. And it, whatever slop they threw in the hole was supposed to do. But none of our potholes are suitable and I don't even care if they waste money paving the street if they're just going to come and tear it up again. We have to start getting after all of the uh, utilities to make them repair correctly and seal afterwards because if they leave the cut and the water gets down in there it's a waste, waste of money, waste of money and I'm tired of seeing it. It's just totally disgusting. Uh, a couple of weeks. There must be a half a dozen places where Mulberry Street was repaired. Now, and, and they're very poor repairs. And, and it's right up and down the street all the way up towards CMC. So check it out for yourself sometime. And uh, now we have a situation. It's part national and it's part local. 501C4s except on public welfare. So if I want to set up a library, or if I want to set up a homeless shelter, or a shelter for battered women, I'm supposed to be tax exempt. Well, now these political organizations moved in because in 1959, they changed it to primarily instead of exclusively public welfare. And uh, I have this to give you and they get the bok, bok, bok for this week because personally I think that they shouldn't have any tax exemption for any political activity. Thank you. I have to give 20% of the money before I come to your uh, rally uh, to, the, to the government. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I didn't spill nothing on you there, Frank. Thank you and have a good night. You also. John Robinson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Finally get to meet y'all in person, huh? I'm always watching y'all guys on TV. I want to appreciate y'all work, hard work. Um, my name is John Robinson. I'm a property owner. Um, and I'm a food vendor for over eight years, and I pay mercantile tax as well. Um, today is May 16, 2013. The city of Scranton have a very good opportunity to step outside the box, be open-minded to some changes. The diversity of the residents in the city, as well as the added food vendors in the city is an example of the changes that are needed and wanted and will benefit all of Scranton. Food vendors, like restaurants, buy goods and supplies from other businesses in the city, and sometimes we can even hire help. Restaurants on some blocks are right next to each other. One business does not affect the other. Vendors are not in front of any restaurants, and so being even 25 feet away will not affect any restaurants. People need to have choices. Um, and people will choose to go where they want to go, regardless of what you guys decide to do. 
we need to give people more choices to eat. Um, that's going to increase business for the city. Um, the more the more businesses, whether it be a food truck, restaurant, or what have you, will increase business. Um, and less choices, or will be less business. You mentioned earlier about leveling the playing field, and I agree with that. Um, it is time to level the playing field. Some restaurants get city funding to open their businesses. So I understand the city may have a vested interest in those restaurants. I didn't receive any funding. I didn't receive any loans. I didn't, get, I didn't borrow no money from my parents. I was just vigilant what I wanted to do, and I worked very hard to do it. Um, a little over eight years ago, I had a vision to start my business, and I did. And I also had a vision to, to do it at night when the clubs closed. Um, there were no restaurants open at that time. There was, there was, was no other vendors at that time. Um, eight years later, there are many vendors. And there are lots of people who appreciate us being out there. Lots of people. Um, and it's at the courthouse. So, I mean, it's in a safe environment and people do appreciate us. Um, like I said, there were no restaurants open after 10 p.m. Now restaurants want to get a part, to have a part of that business, and that's their choice. But I have a problem with them having that choice and us, us not having the choice to stay. Um, when is enough going to be enough? I believe city council need to really take a look at being, uh, looking out for us little guys, people who who are not part of the establishment, people who work hard, obey, obey the law, and basically just want a fair share. We just want a fair share of the American dream and the possibility to even open up a restaurant. Um, in closing, uh, there are a lot of special events at the courthouse. Um, I don't really know the ins and outs of how they get their passes or vending licenses or whatever, but the courthouse, it is county property as I understand it, right? It's county property. And so I think to, to say that the courthouse should be off limits for city vendors would be a discredit to the vendors and the city. The courthouse should be open to the vendors because it's been done for years. It's always done for special events. And if it could be done for them, it should be done for us regularly. Um, so basically, that's all I have. You know, and I appreciate your time. Thank you right. very much. That concludes our sign-in sheet. Is there anyone who'd like to address City Council? Joshua Mast, local uh, business owner. Um, thank you for tabling uh, the food truck tonight. Um, I'm reading this actually on behalf of Scranton Tomorrow and what was sent over. So. On behalf of Scranton Tomorrow, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Over the past month, Scranton Tomorrow has, con uh, has convened and facilitated numerous meetings with members of the restaurant and food vendor community. Scranton Tomorrow began by reviewing and educating the group in the current, of the current ordinance with the assistance of Mr. Mark Seitzinger, Director of Licensing, Inspection, and Permits. We then reviewed and openly discussed the recently proposed ordinance. The meetings were a great example of the power of open dialogue. We found that both groups had valid issues, concerns, and suggestions. Scranton Tomorrow documented the issues raised by both groups and systematically facilitated and res a respectful and in-depth conversation. Yesterday, Scranton Tomorrow facilitated the final meeting with both groups. Approximately 20 individuals were in attendance. The meeting focused on finalizing a cohesive proposal for the review and approval of Scranton's mayor and the city council. This meeting was viewed as a successful outcome by those present. The process has allowed both the brick and mortar businesses and the food vendor operators to work collectively. This newly formed respect has already developed into a meaningful and economically positive partnerships. The following items are proposed and we respectfully ask that you approve on behalf of the restaurant owners and food vendor operators. Distance. Vendors must be, with, must be at least 100 feet from the restaurant service area and public ingress and egress. The service area shall extend outdoors as permitted through the encroachment ordinance which would have been passed by council. This rule will apply 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Further description and clarification is needed should rule apply to the facilities with health licenses. Currently, Rite Aid applies because they sell food and beverage, packaged, not prepared foods. This is a question. Penalties for not abating by the ordinance. Health violation. Food trucks should incur the same fine structures as restaurants. Both operates with retail food facilities licenses. Distance violation. First time should be a warning written and documented. Second time, a 500 fee will be imposed on those who are cited for non-compliance of this ordinance. Private property. If a food truck vendor is operating on privately owned parking lot, the 100 foot rule will not apply. The property owner or vendor must notify the Department of LIPS in writing approving the operation of the vendor and the property owner to avoid compliance issues. Licensing fee. All food vendors will pay $250 annually. If parking at a public meters, they must abide by the Scranton Parking Authority meter rules and regulations. Hours of operation. We would like to rewrite the entire section, remove the half hour after sundown to 8 a.m. clause and replace with the following. Vendors may operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The vendor must vacate the space upon conclusion of the business day or evening. Therefore, they may not leave vehicles, carts, etc., on the streets overnight define conclusion of business and space. Additional items not within the scope of this ordinance were discussed and will be brought to the attention of the city solicitor for future discussion and clarification. On behalf of Scranton tomorrow and the businesses that participate in this process, I thank you for your attention to this matter and your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Um, I'm gonna add, uh, Oh, okay. Before, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, where they had under hours of operation, um, I think it may be better. Um, I, the, the concern for the 24 7, or the concern for the 8 a.m. and whatever clause was overnight parking. Uh, and I think one way in which you can avoid that is to just put in a clause that says, that the, the trucks can only be there, can only be in metered space at the meters during their hours of operation. So as soon as, you know, as long as you're open and serving food, can be at a meter. Once you stop serving food, it has to be removed. I think that that would be easier to understand than putting in certain hours. So, but something that we'll consider. Thank you, that was all for me. Thank you, Mr. McGough. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Parking meter contract, and I mentioned 60,000, but no one up there said that 60,000 is only for one year. Otherwise, they are not planning to pay for the meter citation. Other words, remember that piece of legislation that came down before where we would pay for the cars, the, the people doing the, writing the citations, and the meters, and this and that, and whatever. This is coming again. This contract is useless. There's no reason why we couldn't do this in-house. No way in heck we couldn't do it in-house. Surely there must be some in the administration that has enough brains to handle 50, uh, no, is there 11 or 12 citation issues? Something like that, ain't that many, or eight, something in that neighborhood. And there's no, there's a guy who runs the whole police department. There's a guy that runs the whole fire department. But we don't have a person qualified to, to oversee eight meter mates, or whoever the citation is in our male or female. This thing is, you know what it's gonna be. It's gonna cost us thousands and thousands of dollars more than we have to pay. There's nothing wrong with a dollar meter. That to me is already high enough. And a lot of the, you talk about people being pushed away from meters. When the lady was here, she said she fed the meters at the stores. Many of them meters, that's being utilized are being utilized by employees of different stores not by the public and the reason why you know why the parking authorities do aren't high but i don't see 
why we should get into another contract. We don't need contracts. We need people with brains. That's what we need. We need an open, honest, and efficient government. And these things are lacking. To say that we're going to vote on an RFP for $60,000 that covers one man or one nothing, or you don't even know what it's going to cover. Because the meat of it is not there. Remember the lady said, where's the meat? Well, where's the meat in this legislation that's going to come down to you? You should get on the ball, get a hold and find out what all the little things are. Ask up there, order up there, request up there, or like they like some of the people would say, subpoena them. But you got to get answers before it comes before you, because they're always coming in with these stupid emergency certificates. We're in dire trouble with money. So we're going to pass this thing and lose hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we don't need to lose. The parking authority is a lost cause. As soon as it gets it to your mind, it's a lost cause, we can move on on it. We're stuck with it. I would have asked some people to resign long ago, but you sit up there and said they're fellow Democrats. Why should we ask them to resign? Rogan was the only one that made sense when he said our business manager should resign. He should have because he didn't present a good case. True, he's not a lawyer, but he has all these lawyers behind him. But look at what's happening. $60,000 to run these parking meters when you know there's a lot of additional costs that's going to be borne by the taxpayer of the grant. It doesn't make sense. Look around, find somebody that can do it. We used to do it. We did it for many, many years. But for some reason or other, the parking authority got into trouble, and you know why. And that's why we went to all this other garbage. Look around amongst the people that you have in-house. Surely there must be a person there that can do it. It's not too complicated to oversee eight people or 10 people. I remember some of my friends used to go around and collect the money. You see them collecting the money with the little cart where you jump it in like something like the transit company, or you couldn't open it, nobody could steal it. But that was done years and years ago. Why we got away from it? Probably for the parking authority. They needed money, and they needed another source of money. And we gave them that source. Why do you want to go back to that deal? The parking meters are ours. They're independent of the parking garages. And for anybody that tries to combine them is the wrong way to go. All it is is a giveaway. OK, I won't talk no more on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, resident and taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I was late coming tonight, but I understand that you have uh, tabled 7C through E. Yes. And I yes. wonder if that is a proper procedure prior to uh, fifth order to table a motion. Uh, Mr. McGough made the request of me to make the motion early on in the meeting in order that the public would be aware because we had so many food vendors that were present this evening. And to alleviate their fears, I agreed with him that it would be done at the beginning of the meeting. I don't think it's going to make uh, any, any type of uh, difference in the action. Well, it's, it, is, it is precedent setting, however. Now I'll move on to uh, uh, several weeks ago, uh, legislation was passed to remove parking meters from uh, the corner at Penn and Vine, or Linden. And I came by there the other day and all of those parking spaces were occupied by cars, except the only difference is now they're parking without paying a parking fee. Um, I think that Part of our problem is we're penny wise and pound foolish. In the old days, I remember the no parking curbs, when we still had curbs, used to be painted 
another color, so it was clear it was no parking. And I must admit, if I hadn't been at, at, at a, the meeting here and I saw a, a, a pole without a head, and it was a parking space to me, I would park there as well. But so I think when we, when we decide that it's no parking, it, there's some means has to be done to mark those as no parking. And then we have to start enforcing some of our rules. I used to laugh when I, uh, when I lived in Virginia and I came home and would stop at this one stop sign, it would say stop, and then underneath somebody had written and pray. And I always thought it was sort of funny, but now I understand it. The parking is so bad, people park sometimes out into the street. And that's exactly what you have to do. It, you don't, your field of view is totally obliterated and you just have to sort of inch out and if you get creamed, I guess you get creamed. Um, I, several months ago now, I, I brought an idea to council and I don't think anything has been done with it. I believe it was the mayor of Carbondale, but I'm not sure, uh, deputized some people to, uh, they were, at, in this instance, they were uh, firefighters who were not, uh, not working to go out and do traffic citations uh, of the police nature, parking in front of fire hydrants and, and all of the things. We're missing not only, not only are we doing a disservice to our people by making them, when they're in that, this town, think that that's normal for any other city and then they go out of town and get clobbered with a, a traffic violation because Scranton is unique. And I think it's time we start ticketing people and I don't think it would take too long for people to get smart and stop doing some of these things that are really terrible. And I think that needs to be investigated further. Um, the next item I have uh, is a f sort of a, what the same thing uh, Mr. Uh, Dobson spoke of, which is the statue on the property I believe you're selling to PennDOT. Um, I, I know the price is higher than the, the CRL um, times the, times the, um, the assessment of that property, but I wonder since it's, since the uh, old bridge is going to be maintained until the new one is up, and then I assume that road, once the road is straightened, can become park, that we should get some land back. And I would like to suggest that Duffy Park remain and that a place be found for, to store that Duffy Memorial until the Harrison Avenue Bridge is complete and it should be placed on the, the other side of the, the street and, and Duffy Park should remain. Do you know at the present time what the plan is for that statue? No, I do not. Did, did you not last week uh, vote to take that money and, that we're getting for that and, and place it someplace else? Um, a suggestion was made by Councilman Rogan that that money be allocated toward paving with his colleagues agreement. Uh, as far as I know, we were all in agreement and w an amendment will have to be written uh, to that piece of legislation for next week's meeting uh, when it reaches seventh order, that it will be allocated toward the paving program. Um, I, I would strongly uh, urge you to table that until we find out what becomes of that monument uh, so that it can, and maybe the money has to go toward that. It's a, it's a big, heavy thing, and uh, I think the first priority should be to find a place to store it until the project is complete and then bring it back. Or if there's a place to store it where they're not going, when PennDOC's not going to use it in the other side of Harrison Avenue to move it now. But I don't think that's going to be cheap, and I think that should be the first priority. Um, and now moving on to another sort of missed, I don't know if it's, well, I guess it's wasted, uh, wasted manpower. Uh, I heard one, and I would give attribution if I remembered which one it was, but I've been to too many debates now. Um, if I may complete this thought, I'll bring the rest back next week. Uh, and that is 10 percent of the people who are eligible or should pay the trash fee in the city do not pay. So we're only collecting 90 percent. And this, a woman, uh, when I was down at Boscov's trying to help the economy of the city along, uh, stopped me 
and talked and she spoke again I don't recall the the city or the borough but they actually have placards that you get and you put a new like your like your license so you get a new one for every year that you could put over and it shows that your ta your tax is paid and I don't think we should be collecting trash from people who aren't paying their trash fee it's that simple and uh, they could get done a lot faster and maybe the collections would go up a lot more if we didn't service people without them paying so I'll be back next week with the rest thank you thank you thank you um, please remind people to vote next Tuesday thank you Ms. Carrera um, if we could send a, um, a letter regarding um, I believe it's Penn and Linden where the parking meters were removed for the um, installation of the privately owned parking lot that no parking signs need to be erected in that area and um, also if we can please send a letter to the mayor and uh, the DPW head regarding the Duffy Monument, what the plans are for the monument, can it be stored, if so, where? And we'd like a, a response to that prior to next week's meeting, please. Is there anyone else? Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Uh, Good, Good evening. evening. Just like to uh, begin this evening by uh, going back and discussing the pools. Uh, pleased to learn last week uh, that we were all informed by Councilman Joyce that, uh, you know, in fact, this summer we can uh, look forward to uh, Novembrino Pool uh, being open over in West Side, as well as uh, Connell Park, uh, Weston Park, Weston Field, and Niagara Park. Uh, obviously, it's been a long time coming. And uh, obviously, we're hopeful that some of the funding still goes through. But as Councilman Joyce alluded to last week, it does uh, look like that will come into fruition. And uh, thankfully, the children won't suffer another summer. Uh, I've, I don't think anybody's been as passionate as I have from this podium about that uh, year after year. So I, I give a lot of credit to Councilman Joyce for that and spearheading those efforts and reaching out to the mayor and uh, finally getting that done. So I, I do want to commend you for that, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just briefly discuss, I normally don't get into, uh, you know, things I see in the paper, but, uh, and I have a lot of respect for this individual, uh, a letter to the editor that I did come across yesterday from Mr. Jackwitz, and I, I do have a lot of respect for Mr. Jackwitz. He's been coming here uh, for many years as myself, and uh, he's expressed his opinion on a wide variety of issues, but, uh, you know, I just have to take issue with his editorial because I, I, I find a lot of it to be very misleading and, and unfactual. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to... Uh, to make a statement that, uh, you know, the residents and particularly the candidates who are running for office in the city, uh, you know, don't realize how bad that the mayor and the council uh, are going to leave the city financially. I, I think those are uh, very misleading statements to make and, and, and quite frankly unfair statements to make. Uh, I think anyone who's paid attention, close attention, uh, to, to what's been going on in the city recently, you would know quite well that uh, this council didn't cause the problem. Uh, anybody that's been coming here for years, as I have, and anybody that's been paying attention and, and been listening uh, would know that for the last year you've been fighting vigorously uh, to prevent a lot of these uh, massive tax increases and, and massive layoffs from, from possibly coming, coming into play. And, you know, when we take a trip back to the summer, because that's pretty much where we always uh, go back to, is we fall back to last August uh, throughout that whole recovery plan process. Um, if we paid attention, we would know that uh, this council was pinned into a corner on several occasions by the Pennsylvania Economy League uh, and this administration. And you were pretty much uh, held hostage in certain uh, instances in, in terms of, if we all remember when Pell offered us that grant and that loan. And basically it was, you know, if you put our recovery plan and, and, and pass it, you know, we'll give you what you want. And you weren't going to fall for that. You weren't going to be bullied because that was the step, that was the action and, and the philosophy you, you took when you came into office, that you weren't going to be bullied and, and you weren't going to allow Pell and the administration to push you around. You very easily could have given in. Um, I'm sure the last council majority would have given in because they're the council that's caused uh, the mess we're in. And I think when we talk about, 
whether or not the candidates have an understanding of where we are if they're if they're going to realize that council left us in a bad spot my fear is that this is the complete opposite my question is do some of these candidates that are seeking office no particular candidates but do some of these candidates even have an idea of where we stand because we hear an awful lot about cooperation and a lot of other things that they seem to just babble about but do they really have an understanding of what's going on because you, you never see any of them down here so it's hard for me to imagine that they have a clear understanding of where the city truly stands at this point in time and when we want to talk about criticizing the council as I said we could have easily given in passed Pell's plan the mayor's plan raised taxes 80 90 100 percent and really stuck it to the taxpayers so when we come up to this podium and we make those comments I think you know we need to really sit back and, and think how lucky we are to have this council because you were the only ones that stood in between a massive tax increase massive layoffs and, and we could snicker and talk in the audience all we want but I think we'll all be laughing next year at this time when we have a new council majority who unfortunately I, I don't feel uh, you know I, I, I truly believe that we're gonna be really sorry next year at this time because uh, I think we might have taken for granted what we have here this is history here and we're not gonna see this again because for the last year and a half we've had three people working tirelessly on behalf of the residents of this city and yeah you took criticism you know, one thing I know from coming here is you're never going to please everyone. No matter what decision it is you make, you're never going to please anyone. And that, that's when it comes to time, when it's time for people to step up. When we want to be critical and we want to say no to everything and we don't have any plans ourselves, and we think everything's so easy. And that's what really gets me to is throughout this whole process uh, for the last year and a half particularly, um, everything is so easy to so many people. And I really wish it was. We all think we could just snap our finger and we're going to turn everything around. We think, oh, we need to make cuts. We need to do this. We need to cut salaries. It's so easy, isn't it? If it was that easy, then I think we would have done that. But as we said, there's only so much you can cut. We did everything we could to avoid bankruptcy. And, you know, I want to make it quite clear that another misleading comment, yeah, you will lose your services if a receiver comes in. You will have massive tax increases. You'll have less police and firemen on the street. And your garbage will not be collected. I think the residents need to realize that. So when we take a look back in time, uh, you made tough decisions, difficult decisions, but we are better off than we were four years ago. And it's something I think we're all going to be sorry because I, I do have a, a scary feeling that we're unfortunately going to go back uh, in time to the old politics. And I just hope the voters in this town uh, come out Tuesday and make smart choices because we can't afford to go back in time. We need to move forward. And, and uh, there's only more difficult decisions to make down the road. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Mary Chilipko, resident city of Scranton. It's a shame it's all come to this. And I know you tried to intervene, Mr. McGough. Thank you. As far as political rhetoric. Um, I just wanted to come here on behalf of the Pinebrook Neighborhood Association because I don't see any, met, any uh, mention of the House Avenue pool or Penridge Complex in plans for opening pools this summer. I don't know if it's been forgot about or abandoned. No, it hasn't been forgot about or abandoned. I did ask the mayor about opening all pools in the city. And unfortunately, um, this is a pool that needs serious repairs. And? Pardon? And? And unfortunately, we don't have the funds right now to use out of the RERI account to repair the pool and open it. That's. What okay. I was told. Well, since you speak to the mayor now frequently, if you could please just go back to him and just let him know that the residents of the area will work hard to get that pool reopened. I think that at this point there are probably repairs that need to be made at Novembrino Pool. And I would just hate to see our neighborhood. I'm glad for any neighborhood or pool that is being opened this summer. But I would hate to see our Capouse Avenue pool be left out. And we will work hard. I hear people talking about the little guy tonight. I know um, legislation's been tabled, but I actually stopped down and I did see, I believe her name is Joan Marie in her food truck. She, Mr. Hughes, Attorney Hughes explained the part about the sunset rule. And she was just setting up um, around eight o'clock. And she was setting up in front of Mulligan's in the backyard Yale house. So I don't, uh, I did not see any kind of problem. I wish I could work that hard, I really do. The little guy always, little guy has a history of getting knocked around in Scranton. And it's nice to see that they're starting to stand up for themselves, become educated. 
I heard a gentleman mention something taboo that some of the restaurants may have city money, as we call it, involved with them. I'm glad residents and, and small business people are becoming educated. It's time for the little guy to rise. Um, I do only have one more question tonight. Um, is, is Mr. Miller a counsel for school director or city council? He's here. I, you can ask him after you're seated. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Faye Ferranis, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. About two weeks ago, I attended a court hearing that Joe Pacheski filed two lawsuits against Bill Courtright, the tax collector. It was in front of Judge Mazzoni at the courthouse. I was really stunned at this, at this hearing. I was rather shocked. Billy Courtright, the tax collector, when he ran for office three and a half years ago, he ran on the platform. One of his biggest claims to get elected was he would stop commingling funds. Three and a half years and he's still commingling funds. He's saying he doesn't have enough time. It takes a lot of time. Well, I think three and a half years is sufficient. And he lied to the voters back then. Now, he had all his employees intact from January 2012, 2010 through June 30th, 2012. The only reason he lost the employees halfway through 2012 was the state law changed, and he was no longer allowed to collect the wage tax. Those employees were in charge of wage tax collection. What I can't understand is it's a state law. And Judge Mazzoni was asking, is this something that always took place? And they said, yes, it, it always has. But that doesn't make it right. Just because nobody, just because a district attorney in Lackawanna County and other law enforcement people or judges didn't enforce this law doesn't mean it's not a law. And it wasn't enforced probably because of politics. And it may not be again. So it's a two-year prison sentence and a $5,000 fine and or a $5,000 fine. And, and, and he's just not even considering it. Joe Pacheski offered him the chance right there and then in front of Judge Mazzoni. If he would say that day at, of the hearing, if he would stop commingling funds from that day forward, if he would start to do it the right way, and also to use a city lawyer like he's supposed to instead of hiring his own lawyer, he would just drop this lawsuit, it would all go away. And through his lawyer, uh, Attorney Abrahamson, he said no, he would not do that. He said no, he would not stop commingling funds, and he would not use a city lawyer. He had a chance to say, yes, I would do that. He said it would take too long. Well, I think three and a half years is long enough. I find it amazing that he complies with the state law regarding notifying Ms. Randall about starting negative campaigns against her, but yet he won't comply with the state law saying he can't commingle funds. I think it's outrageous. And this is a man, someone wants to vote for mayor? I don't think so. Let me remind some of the people, because I looked at some of my tapes of the previous council meetings, and just some of the votes that he, just a couple of the votes that he voted for. Let me see Ms. here. Evans, I'm going to reiterate that I think this is inappropriate for the podium, but I know that you said you would allow it. Yes, I just wanted to I, state that. I, and I, I thank you. But again, everyone has a First Amendment right Understood. to free speech. And whether we agree with them, whether we like what they're saying or not, they have that right. And I've granted that right to many other speakers tonight and every other night. And so I think, you know, I, I can't selectively enforce. Thank you. Bill Courtright voted yes to the mayor's borrowing and budget in 2005. He voted yes to the parking authority borrowing $35 million. He voted to bail out the Hilton Hotel, which lost $3 million for the city on the deal. He sat there on the fence and waffled on every issue except ones pertaining to the police unions, which is another thing he's doing now. He's still not publicly endorsing the police or firemen because he knows the people in Scranton. 
most of the people in the city are not union people. They, they don't like the pays that the unions get. So he would lose votes if he publicly supported them or said he was for them. But make no mistakes, he's behind them all the way. So that's about it. And I just wanted to say about the food trucks, I think they're wonderful. I think they give a lot to the people that, that don't have time to go to restaurants or want to get dressed up or just going by. I think 100 feet is sufficient. I don't think it should be any further away. Uh, that would hurt them, and that's not right. And competition is great, and their food is wonderful. And I think you should really consider this uh, for the betterment of the people in the city. The more businesses, the better for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Thank there you. anyone else? Mrs. Craig? 5A motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I did fail to uh, one announcement uh, earlier. Um, this weekend will be the second annual Scranton Celtic Festival to be held at Montage Mountain. Uh, that's Saturday and Sunday. Um, entertainment, food, vendors, and all things Celtic. Um, last year it was their first year. It was a uh, great success. Uh, hopefully more people will attend this year. Um, it can be a great event. Uh, on Monday, I contacted uh, Mark Dewar and asked him about the situation on Pike Street that Mr. Galdieri had um, spoke about um, last week. Uh, he did say that he feels it's a legitimate concern. The reason it has not been paved is a matter and I'll give you his answer. I'm not asking that anybody necessarily like it, um, that it was a matter of priority and money um, for not paving it, but that he said that he would go out to Pike Street, take a look at it again, and see if there is anything that can be done to help alleviate the problem. Um, so hopefully, hopefully he will do that, and hopefully something can be done um, in the near future. Uh, as far as the food truck and restaurant meetings, um, I, I think that uh, it's a great example of what open, honest dialogue can do to resolve a situation. Um, I would extend my thanks to Leslie Collins and Scranton tomorrow for facilitating the meetings that were held and for preparing the recommendations that were presented to us um, for our perusal. Um, I think that this is a way in which you go about resolving problems. Uh, get the parties together, um, you know, sit down and have an open dialogue about it, and I'm glad that it's worked out, and I think we have a number of things to look at. Um, good suggestions that um, are workable and hopefully we can implement into the legislation so that um, we can move forward with that. Uh, rental registration, I was not asked tonight and I actually had some answers. Um, um, to date, there have been 1,220 um, rental registrations. Um, there are less than 50 inspections done. They have had difficulty. Now these are the safety inspections done on the rental properties. Um, two things have occurred. Number one, they have been working to increase the database since they, they felt that was their first obligation, which I think when we passed the legislation said that was the initial phase was to you know, get as many properties uh, listed as possible. And they also spoke of the difficulty of arranging for the inspections um, so that they can get to the properties to have them inspected. Um, I was told that they were hopefully moving to do more um, inspections uh, during the summer months. And as they, as they have compiled, uh, as they're finishing compiling the database or getting close to it. And I believe the last question that was asked was, have 
the this information been sent to the single tax office and i was told that they were not aware that they should turn this over to the single tax office and um, they have not done that um, and i will contact attorney kelly to see if that is their responsibility or if he feels that is their responsibility i'd also i'm also going to hopefully contact the single tax office after next week's election when perhaps i you know <laughs> it will be settled down a little bit more um to determine um you know what needs to be done as far as that is concerned uh and one last thing uh if we have any list of paving requests for the night i would just like to uh if you would put one one request on for me mrs craig if um the nine and ten hundred blocks of clay avenue i was asked if i would um, mention that and uh, again as was said before hopefully um, people will this is an important election uh, even though it is a primary election there are a number of there are a number of issues that are very significant to the um, to the city of Scranton and to Lackawanna County and I encourage everyone um, all registered voters to go out and to um, make their opinions known through the electoral process um, so that we can have a reasonable idea of what the people of Lackawanna County and the people of Scranton truly want. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Councilman Rogan, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, uh, very briefly. Just one matter of business first. Um, I see that Mr. Loscom is, is not here tonight in item 7F. Um, is under the Public Safety Committee. So I would like to make a motion to appoint Mr. Joyce as the temporary chair for the Committee on Public Safety. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Thank you. Um, just one item to speak on tonight, then a few requests. Um, and this is an item that one of the speakers brought up tonight. Um, it was brought to my attention that Jackson Street in West Scranton, which was recently paved um, using the funding that council allocated from the CDBG funding for paving. Um, road was paved, nice and smooth, looks great. About a week later, um, it was marked up. Um, there was spray paint on the roads, looked like somebody was about to do road work. And then we see the article in the paper, I believe two days ago, about the water company replacing 100-year-old lines and I certainly would like to see the lines replaced but I don't know who dropped the ball on the communication between the water company in the city or if this is something that PPNL decided to do after the road was paved which I don't think is the case these things seem to be planned out years years ahead of time um, you know with, with resources so scarce the way they are today and with so many roads in the city that need to be paved it is frustrating that we paved a road that is going to be torn up in a few months. Um, Mrs. Craig, can we please send a letter to um, it's a few department heads, actually, to the mayor, Ms. Abley, Mr. Dewar, um, asking who is in charge of checking with utilities um, to see if they're going to do road work before a city is placed on the city pave list. And this is something that is upsetting this time, but it, it can't happen again. Um, with the very small amount of money we have for paving, we need to make sure we're paving roads that aren't going to be touched by utilities. Um, for instance, I, I, I'm on Bromley Avenue, and there are three or four blocks on Bromley that were um, new gas lines were installed a few years ago, and the, the road was so torn up afterwards, the utility completely repaved the road, which is great. Um, but we, we don't want to pave that road with city, actually federal dollars appropriated to the city, and then have a utility repave it when we could be paving other roads. Um, just a few citizens' requests. Um, I ran into a resident from Cherry Street over the weekend um, who mentioned to me that there's a lot. It's located either at 533 or 535 Cherry Street that is um, overgrown with weeds, um, bushes, things of that nature. And he contacted the city um, to see who was responsible for cleaning it up. And he was told that it was actually a county-owned property. 
So Mrs. Craig, can we please notify the county commissioners of this issue and hopefully they can address it um, for the residents in that area. Um, finally, or two more issues. Um, we received a, a very long list of potholes um, to be sent to Mr. Dewar. The majority of these are in South Scranton and East Mountain. I won't read them all off, but there are um, about a half dozen or a dozen here. And also two requests from two separate residents um, that had issues um, that they're working on with licensing and inspections and they haven't been able to get a hold of somebody by phone. Now, I have been told from people in the department that there has been a problem with the phones um, in licensing and inspections. So can we please um, send the two requests here um, to Mr. Dewar, or I'm sorry, to Mr. Seitzinger, and also ask if the phones in LIPS are working correctly for outside calls um, so residents can, can get in touch with city inspectors and, and the directors as well. And finally, I would just like to encourage everyone to come out and vote. On Tuesday, May 21st, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And please be sure to vote both sides of the ballot. Um, the front side will be candidates for county and actually state, county, and city office. Um, the back side will be the referendum questions um, regarding the change, uh, proposed change in county government. And that's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes. Um, very briefly tonight. Last week, uh, I mentioned that I was speaking with Mayor Doherty regarding pools and using uh, some of the UDAG repayment money or RERI money to open additional pools this summer. And we received a letter back from Paul Kelly, uh, the city solicitor, and he's, and he's stating that we need some more information before he drafts the legislation that I requested. And uh, one, he asked how much money is required by Parks and Rec to open these pools. And after speaking to Mayor Doherty about this issue, he um, indicated that $15,500 would be needed to open each pool uh, for the upcoming summer swimming season in order to cover costs for lifeguards, pool chemicals, etc. And the second question that Mr. Kelly asked was if there were enough free refunds to meet that figure. And does OECD need to move funds from one account to another? And just to um, give everyone an update, Ms. Abley uh, kindly responded to many of the, or to basically all of the questions that Mr. Kelly had. And she states that there's approximately $66,000 left in the RERI account. And they're also, and OECD is also anticipating a payment of 63,36089. Uh, and that's anticipated money from the PA emergency management agency for the reimbursement of the Crisp Avenue Bridge project. Also, uh, one has to consider that we're also taking $20,000 out of the RERI account for ECTV and $10,000 for Elmhurst Boulevard. But when all is said and done, there will be enough money in the RERI account to open up additional pools this summer. And Mr. Kelly also asked, whether or not this was legal to uh, use OECD funds, uh, being the RERI funds, for, uh, for swimming complexes. And Ms. Abley did reply back that the uh, Urban Development Ac Action Grant um, expired approximately 30 years ago, and there are no federal re regulations attached to them, and therefore the funds are eligible to be used for swimming pool purposes. And Mayor Doherty is in full agreement that funds uh, should be used to open up uh, two additional swimming pools this summer in addition to the uh, grant money that he anticipates will receive to open up uh, Weston Park and Weston Field. So that's just a quick update on that. Also, uh, in other matters, we received uh, a letter from Rossi, and Rossi, our independent auditor, 
uh, stating that there's a number of issues uh, that need to be settled before the audit can be completed. Mrs. Craig, if we could please uh, contact Ryan McGowan and ask him for an updated status report just so we know where we're, where we're at on all issues. And that's all for tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I wish to begin by offering my deepest gratitude to the Scranton police officers, firefighters, and EMTs who responded to the motor vehicle accident in which my husband and daughter were involved last weekend. Their quick response, professionalism, and compassion were superlative. And my family has nothing but the utmost admiration and appreciation for these very special men and the difficult work they perform. Special thanks go out to our dear friends Dave, Faye, Danny, and Wayne, without whose constant help we couldn't have managed through that day and night. And now we turn to council business. I've only a few brief <coughs> topics to address. Granton City Council received a written response yesterday from Attorney Daniel Penitar, Scranton Zoning Board solicitor, regarding the properties located in the 400 block of Clay Avenue and reported to City Council by Hill Section homeowners. I'd like to read Attorney Penitar's response at this time. Per your letter of May 10th, 2013, it appears from what you have provided to me that <clears throat> 1021 Mulberry LLC, represented by Joseph Ferdinand Esquire, has filed an appeal of the zoning officer's decision to issue permits regarding the above properties. I believe the case will be on the zoning board's agenda for June 2013. Therefore, it would be premature for me to comment on a case pending before our board as no evidence has yet to be presented and no decision has yet to be made. I thank Attorney Penitar, Mrs. Carrie Newcomb, and Mr. Steve Bartnicki, zoning board members, for their prompt attention and recommend that all interested neighbors of the six or seven uh, Clay Avenue properties and those surrounding it should attend the June 12th 2013 zoning board meeting. Also, requests for qualifications for the West Lackawanna Bridge project were opened yesterday and the bidders included Riley Associates, CHA or Clow Harbor Associates, Shaner Environmental and SECO Associates Incorporated. Since SECO is under contract with the city of Scranton, and serves as the city engineer, it would appear to have a conflict of interest in bidding on this project. For example, SECO, as the city engineer, would have to inspect and sign off on various aspects of this project. If awarded the contract for the bridge repair project, SECO would then, in fact, be inspecting and signing off on its own work thus eliminating the objectivity required for such inspection and approval. I would prefer to see the administration select one of the remaining three bidders, and with my colleague's agreement, I ask Mrs. Craig to send a letter on behalf of City Council to the mayor, business administrator, and city solicitor, solicitor notifying them of our concern and recommendation. Next, uh, the legislation related to the funding of the West Lackawanna Avenue Bridge Project that was tabled during the May 2nd, 2013 Council meeting should be amended to add the blighted property tracking system in the amount of $20,000 and to delete some of the transferred funds of the accounts of the West Side Falcons and North Scranton Little League projects. City planner Don King stated that the funding for the blighted property tracking system couldn't be used since the system cannot operate within the city's current financial computer program. Consequently, these CDBG funds 
should be utilized for the bridge project in place of the grants that were allocated to the Westside Falcons and North Scranton Little League. Uh, finally, as has been discussed uh, by several individuals throughout the meeting, the Office of City Council didn't receive the recommendations of restaurant owners and food truck and vendor owners from Ms. Collins in adequate time for Council's review and the drafting of an amendment. Uh, consequently, those pieces of legislation, items 7C, 7D, and 7E, were tabled earlier during this meeting. And that's it. Fifth order, no business at this time. Sixth order, 6A, reading by title, file of council number 27, 2013, and ordinance authorizing and approving the right-of-way acquisition of a portion of city-owned property located in, on the 100 block of Harrison Avenue, 8,711 square feet, in the city of Scranton to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, PennDOT, as per PennDOT's offer to purchase and summary of just compensation and to authorize the mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into an agreement of sale to purchase said property for the sum of $21,400 for the purpose of removing the Harrison Avenue Bridge and replacing the Harrison Avenue Bridge. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6B, reading by title, file of council number 28, 2013, and ordinance, transferring a temporary construction agreement of city-owned property located in the 100 block of Harrison Avenue to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation for the construction of the removal of the Harrison Avenue Bridge and installation of a newly constructed Harrison Avenue Bridge for the sum of $7,000. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 21, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials to enter into a sub-grantee and cooperation agreement with the Scranton Public Library for Keystone Recreation, Park and Conservation Fund grant in the amount of $500,000 for repairs to the historic Albright Memorial Library. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final pass and provide the seven-day. Second. On the question, roll call please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 22, 2013, creating and establishing special city account number 02229605 entitled Keystone Recreation Park and Conservation Fund Grant for the receipt and disbursement of grant from the Keystone Recreation Park and Conservation Grant Funds in the amount of $500,000 for repairs to the historic Albright Memorial Library. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question, roll call please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, D, and E have been tabled, so we're moving to 7F for consideration by the Committee on Public Safety for adoption, file of council number 26, 2013 amending file of council number 22 2006 entitled authorizing and approving 
the designation of parking spaces for certain City of Scranton personnel in and along Dix Court, the parking area in the rear of the City of Scranton Municipal Building, and a parking lot along Mulberry Street, adjacent to the Scranton Fire Headquarters, and authorizing the City of Scranton Police Department to enforce the parking designation as reflected in the attached schematic. What is the recommendation of the Acting Chair for the Committee on Public Safety? As the Acting Chair for the Committee on Public Safety, I recommend final passage of item 7 F. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7 F legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.